This is a video of free response question number three from the 2018 AP Physics 1 exam. Question three says, there is a disc shown above that spins about the axle at its center. A student's experiments reveal that while the disc is spinning, friction between the axle and the disc exert a constant torque on the disc. And for part A, at time t equals zero, the disk has an initial counterclockwise positive angular velocity. So the disk is spinning like this, right? At t equals zero, the angular velocity of the disk is omega naught. And under the influence of this constant torque that the disk experiences due to that frictional torque between the disk and the axle, the disk later comes to rest at a time t1, right? So at some time later, when t equals t1, the angular speed will be zero. The actual questions for part A are on the next couple of slides. All right, so once again, we have part A at time t equals zero. The disk has an initial counterclockwise positive angular velocity, omega naught. The disk later comes to rest at a time t equals t1. On the grid at the left below, sketch a graph that could represent the disk's angular velocity as a function of time from t equals zero until the disk comes to rest at time t equals t1. The first thing that I can do when making this graph is to take the given information that says the disk starts with an initial angular velocity of omega naught and ends at a time t1 with an angular velocity of zero. <clears throat> Our problem here is how do we connect those two dots? Is it a curved line? Is it a straight line? And there I'd like to make uh, an analogy to a, a, a situation where an object would be moving in a straight line. In this example they said this spinning or rotating object experiences a constant torque, what would, would be the analogous situation if something was moving in a straight line? <clears throat> the object in a straight line would be experiencing a constant force. And we know that an object experiencing a constant force also has a constant acceleration. And if you remember, a graph of velocity as a function of time the slope of that graph represents an object's acceleration. So that's true for an angularly moving object as well. So the slope of this angular velocity as a function of time graph should tell us about the angular acceleration of the object, which I claim should be constant. And so if the slope is constant between those two points, I simply should connect them with a straight line. So something like that. I don't think it needs to be perfect, but as long as you've made an effort to make that a straight line connecting those two points, starting at omega naught and ending at zero for the angular velocity, you should get full points for that graph. And now let's move on to A2. On the grid at the right below, sketch the disk's angular acceleration as a function of time from t equals t zero until the disk comes to rest at t equals t1. Now we just made an argument about the angular acceleration. If the disk is experiencing a constant torque, it must be experiencing a constant angular acceleration. Now the magnitude of that angular acceleration isn't so clear. We could try to look at the, the slope of the uh, line on the left and try to come up with something, but I think at the end of the day, in order to earn full points on this graph, we basically need to make sure of two things. One, the angular acceleration must always be negative, because the angular velocity was positive and the disk is slowing down, meaning the acceleration must be negative. Secondly, we need to make sure that this graph is a horizontal line because the angular acceleration must be constant. So I'm simply going to start my graph at some negative angular acceleration and continue with a horizontal line representing that constant angular acceleration for the entire duration of the graph. <clears throat> 
Now let's take a look at part B, which says the magnitude of the frictional torque exerted on the disc is tau naught. Derive an equation for the rotational inertia, I, of the disc in terms of tau naught, omega naught, and T1, and any physical constants as appropriate. There are two different but both great approaches to this derivation, and I'm going to show you both of them. One of them is by remembering our definition of angular acceleration, which is alpha equals delta omega over delta t, and by writing the rotational form of Newton's second law, which is the net torque equals rotational inertia times angular acceleration. And these two equations together will allow us to derive this equation. The first thing we could do is um, notice that the object only experiences a single torque, and that's the torque due to the friction between the axle and the disc. That's tau naught. So on the left side of my Newton's second law equation, I'll just write tau naught. On the right hand side, I still have I, but now I'm going to eliminate alpha by plugging in delta omega over delta t. And now we're basically done. We just need to solve this for the rotational inertia variable i and also plug in some of the variables um, that were provided as opposed to leaving them as generic omegas and t's. So this should look something like i equals tau naught delta t divided by delta omega. And you should recognize that we could write this as tau naught times t final minus t initial and in the denominator omega final minus omega initial. And it's our job to recognize that the initial time is zero, the final time is t1. The initial angular speed is omega naught and the final angular speed is zero. So what we end up with is I equals tau naught times T1 divided by omega. Uh, one point of discussion might be uh, whether this answer should be positive or negative. Well, because it's a rotational inertia value, the answer should be positive, but you might be wondering about the negative sign in the denominator. We have zero minus omega naught. So surely there should be a minus in the denominator. But you need to remember that in the numerator, we have tau naught, which represents the frictional torque, or the torque that opposes the motion of the object. And if the motion of the object is in the positive direction, that torque is also negative, and so those negative signs should cancel, leaving us with a positive result for the rotational inertia. Now, uh, there's another way to go about this derivation that's no more difficult uh, and, and not simpler either, but we do arrive at the same answer and, and there's a common way of going about it. So I'll also show that other way. Another way of doing this is to recognize that the equation for angular momentum is L equals I omega and that when an object is experiencing a torque for a time interval delta t, it may undergo a change in angular momentum. Right? This is the equation for angular impulse. Delta L equals tau times delta t. And if we plug everything in, on the left hand side we can write um, L final, which would be you know, I final, omega final, minus L initial, which would be I initial, omega initial, equals tau naught times t1. And once again we'll need to recognize that the final angular speed is zero and the initial angular speed is omega naught. The other thing we need to recognize on the left hand side is that nothing about the mass distribution of the object is changing and so the rotational inertia is a constant fixed value uh, regardless of the angular speed. So I could write this as zero minus I times omega naught equals tau naught times T1. 
Um, and once again, I didn't plug in a negative value for that torque, but know that on the left and right sides of the equation, the negative torque and the negative in front of the I times omega naught term would cancel, leaving us with a positive value for I. And as I sh stated earlier, we end up with the same answer, tau naught times T1 divided by omega naught. In part C of this problem, we're asked to make two very similar graphs, but for a slightly different situation. In another experiment, the disk again has an initial positive angular velocity omega naught at time t equals zero. At time t equals one half of t1, the student starts dripping oil on the contact surface between the axle and the disk to reduce the friction. As time passes, more and more oil reaches the contact surface, reducing the friction even further. And the rest of the directions simply say, you know, go and make those same couple of graphs that we made before. I think the, the best first thing that we could do is recognize that from t equals zero until t equals one half, our graphs should be identical to what we did before because nothing changes until that one half uh, t1 time mark. So from omega naught until one half t1, for the angular velocity graph, I should have that constant slope going through half the graph like that. And for the angular acceleration graph, I should start at the same value as I did before and go to one half t1 without any change. And now the question is, how do the graphs change in the time interval from 1 half t1 until t1? Now, when the oil is added to the axle reducing the friction, please understand that by adding the oil, the, the disk does not speed up. It just slows down at a slower rate, right? It would take longer for it to slow down. And so, for the angular velocity graph, at time t1, the disk would not come to rest. It would take a, a time that's greater than t1 in order for the disk to come to rest. We also know that in that time interval, the acceleration of the disk would be changing, right? Because as more and more oil gets on that contact, the rate at which it's slowing down would change. And so there needs to be a curved line from 1 half t1 until t1 for my velocity graph. And it needs to curve simply such that the disk does not reach zero angular velocity before time t1. So something like this I think would be appropriate. Right? Where as the oil starts to drip onto the surface, the angular velocity starts to not decrease by as much, right? The, the slope becomes uh, smaller and smaller and smaller, and the angular velocity reaches some positive value by the time T1 comes around. Now, how could we address the change in the second half of the angular acceleration graph? Well, in our graph on the left, the uh, slope decreased slightly as we went from 1 half T1 to T1. And so the magnitude of the frictional torque must be decreasing, right? Because the magnitude of the angular acceleration, which is given by the slope on the left, is decreasing. And so there's no real correct way uh, or precise way that we need to make the graph on the right in order to get full credit, but we should try to make it match the one on the left. And so one way I think we can do that is we can have the magnitude of the angular acceleration decrease and I'm not going to make it go to zero because uh, what I believe happens in this experiment is the oil reduces the frictional torque, but it doesn't totally eliminate the frictional torque, meaning that uh, the, the disk will still eventually slow to a stop under the influence of that, that negative angular acceleration. It just doesn't happen at a time t1. So I've shown on the right that the angular acceleration decreases, but not to zero. In the last part of this problem, part D, the student is trying to mathematically model the magnitude tau of the torque exerted by the axle 
on the disk when the oil is present. At times, T is greater than one half T1. The student writes down the following two equations, each of which includes a positive constant C1 or C2 with appropriate units. So we have equations one and two. Which equation better mathematically models this experiment? So we need to pick one, either equation one or equation two, and then briefly explain why the equation we selected is plausible and why the other equation is not plausible. And let's think about what does the torque need to be doing during this time interval from uh, at values greater than one half T1. We know that's when the student starts to drip the oil onto the contact surface there and that causes the torque to be reduced right because there's less of a frictional torque and so when T is greater than one half T1 what we want to happen is we want the torque to decrease and so let's take a look at equation 2 what I notice about equation 2 is that as T increases because it's in the numerator, as T increases, as T increases, because T is in the denominator, the torque, tau, will decrease. And that seems to be a fairly uh, good thing, right? The relationship that, that we suggested, that the frictional torque should decrease as a function of time, seems to be obeyed here in equation number two. Now let's take a look at equation number one. In equation number one, it seems like as T increases, the torque would also increase. So as T increases, the torque would also increase. Now, Recognize that T1 here is a fixed value, right? And this is also correct for equation number two. T1 is a, a fixed value, but T is the changing variable where if we want to, to discover a, a mathematical relationship between the time and the torque, we need to be looking at T. And so I think uh, even though we have those added or subtracted terms, the best way to determine which equation is best is to look at the relationship between T and tau, which is what we've done. And so based on the relationships that I see, it looks like equation number two would be best. Now in my brief explanation down below, right, I need to come up with a brief explanation. What I would do is simply write there that I picked equation two because tau decreases as a function of time. And in equation number one, it doesn't do that. In fact, as time goes on, the torque increases in number one. And that is not consistent with the fact that the oil being added to the contact surface would reduce the friction and therefore reduce the frictional torque between the axle and the disc. And so while equation two is plausible, Equation one is not plausible. So I think equation two is a better mathematical model for uh, trying to uh, create a model for the torque exerted by the axle on the disk.